We are now going to talk about different types of forces, and this isn't going to be mathematically defining them, it's just to give you an overview of what they are and what the notation typically is. And again, we have to start with this because once we want to talk about forces at all, we have to talk about specific forces. So here are some specific forces, many of which I expect you will be familiar with in at least a general way. So the first is gravity, my favorite force. I use it all the time. And gravity is a long-range force. Again, it is our only long-range force that we're going to be dealing with. And the reason is that it is not in contact. That's okay. Gravity still works if objects are not in contact with the ground. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that gravity, in fact, is still a force on an object even once it is in contact with the ground. And we'll have to talk about that in a little bit. So gravity is still pulling on you even if your feet are on the ground. Um, so that's still true. The agent is the Earth or whatever planet or moon you were talking about, the sun even. Um, but in general, will be on planet Earth. This acts on all objects. Every object around Earth that has mass, which all of the objects we will deal with in physics class have mass, um, all of the objects feel the force of gravity. Now, we can say in a picture like this, which is typically what we draw, that the force of gravity acts down. I just want to point out that typically it's towards the center of the planet, right? Imagine some penguins down in Antarctica. They're not falling off the bottom of the Earth. They're pulled towards the center of the Earth. But if I wanted to draw a penguin in Antarctica, it would look, I don't know, I'm going to draw you a really bad penguin. Right? Isn't that roughly what a penguin looks like? I guess with a beak? Yeah, there you go. It's a great penguin, right? So this is a penguin on Antarctica, even though when we think about the Earth, we would say, hey, my penguin is there we would still say the force of gravity is down in this picture because up here the force of gravity is actually always towards the center of the earth. So once or twice in physics class you'll need to think about that, but normally we just say, hey, force of gravity is down. Note that the symbol we use is F sub G. It doesn't matter if you use capital G or lowercase g. I typically use lowercase g. The book uses uppercase g. Same thing. Our next force is the spring force, which is F sub SP for spring. Um, there's a reason that you shouldn't just use F sub S because that will look like a frictional force. Um, now, what's a little bit trickier about springs is that it can exert a push or a pull, whether your spring is starting compressed, i.e. you've squeezed it and now it's pushing apart, versus you've pulled it. Depending on what type of springs you're used to in your everyday life, you might be used to springs doing both of these things, but for instance, if you think about a slinky, a slinky only can be stretched. It doesn't really compress. Its resting state is compressed. So in physics class, we talk about springs that can do both, but in real life, maybe you have a spring that actually can't really be stretched or can't really be compressed. So the math here is a little bit complicated. It's more complicated than all of the other forces that we're dealing with. So we will actually cover this in chapter 9. The spring force will be covered after we talk about forces. So in general, we don't talk about springs. Um, but you should know at least how the pushing and pulling is happening. Now the next force that we do talk about a lot is the tension force. Now you can use capital T with the vector symbol which is what the book uses to represent tension, I prefer using F sub t. Now, one reason to do that would be that this makes it very clear that this is a force. It's not something else. Um, the downside being that if we want to talk later about tangential force, F sub t could look like tangential force. So maybe that's one reason to use capital T. Notation is always going to be a little bit tricky, but again, there's some good choices. Um, and either one of these would be good. So tension is going to be a pull from a string or a rope in general. Uh, you can also have tensions in chains and bars and, and other things. This is going to be parallel to the agent. So the tension force is acting on the sled and is pointed in the direction that the rope is pulling. Again, I hope that this is something that, that makes sense. Um, but 
one of the things that this will come into, like in this case, I'm not asking what's pulling on the rope, but obviously the rope is its own object and something must be pulling on the rope. So there is a separate force that's usually acting on the agent if we're thinking about a string or a rope. And in, I think, two chapters, maybe one chapter, we will be talking about how we start relating multiple objects and multiple forces. But for right now, all you have to do is say, what is my object? In this case, it's the sled. So then we just worry about the tension from the rope on the sled. That's all. OK, now there's a little bit of an aside which is related to the tension force and the next force that we're going to talk about, which is the normal force. And to think about this, we actually need to zoom in and ask what is happening inside a material. And the ball and spring model of solids is a great model of solids. If you've had some chemistry courses, you might have a very different uh, idea in your head of what a solid is, and your model is not wrong. And if you imagine, could kind of simplify it down. So like a crystalline solid or, you know, atoms that are bond that are molecules, sorry, that have, you know, hydrogen bonds between them or van der Waals forces, things like that. It's still kind of like this model. So the idea is that we don't actually care in our solid in intro physics about those molecules per se. We just say that each molecule is say a ball. And again, the distinction here between a molecule and an atom doesn't even matter. So we have an array of balls connected by springs. So what that means is if I, remember I said that if I pull on a spring, if I stretch out a spring, it pulls back. So this is what we say the origin of tension is, that if I try to stretch my object by pulling on it, that's basically like stretching a spring. And so the spring pulls back. And the flip side is, is if you push on your object, those springs compress a little back, a little bit, and then push back. So this is something to help you think about where tension and the normal force come from. And again, it's realizing that when you push on an object, it pushes back. When you pull on an object, it pulls back, because we think about all of those little springs inside actually doing the pushing or pulling. Now, this does only work for solids, doesn't really work for liquids or gases, and we won't be talking about forces in liquids or gases. So you can typically use this. So now the normal force. The normal force is perhaps the hardest force that we're going to use. You're going to use it all of the time and the rules are very basic but somehow tricky to remember later when you're actually doing a calculation. So the first thing about the normal force is that it is a push away from the surface. It is a contact force only works when you're in contact. It is perpendicular to the surface, right? So our frog here is our object sitting on the surface and our normal force is perpendicular, right? So here you go, perpendicular. Normal in this case literally means perpendicular, not meaning normal in terms of like mainstream or everyday, but normal meaning perpendicular. Now, the notation here, the book is using lowercase n with the vector symbol, because vectors are a force, which is a perfectly good decision. You could use capital N. That's OK as well. I am typically going to use F sub n. I use F sub n to, again, see very explicitly that this is a force. So again, using any of these three would be perfectly fine. And if you've learned a different notation in a previous physics class, that might be fine too. I'm not telling you that you can't use anything else, but part of communication is using something that's clear. These are really clear. If you know something else that's clear, you can use that too. But I discourage you from, you know, getting too creative and naming every force with subscripts in, you know, Japanese or Arabic or something like that. That's not going to be clear to me. I'm sorry. So. The last thing to know about the normal force is that it varies in strength. We have to talk more about forces before we really understand what the normal force depends on, and the beginning of chapter 6 will lead us there. But I'm not telling you here what the normal force equals. And I'm not writing it down, but I'll say some stuff. The normal force is not equal to mg cos theta. And this is a mistake that I see students make a lot, is that they have in their mind what the normal force equals, say, mg cos theta. And that's just not true. 
It's true in some situations, but it's not true across the board. So what is always true is that it is a push perpendicular to the surface that varies in strength. And by varies in strength, I mean you just need to know more about the situation to know how strong it is. It doesn't mean that it's constantly going up and down. There's nothing we can do to calculate it. But we have to know inf more information about the entire situation to know what it is. I'm going to stop here since this video is getting a bit long, but the next video will continue into the last group of forces.